In this video, we're going to provide you with the most comprehensive step-by-step -step video guide the internet has ever seen on UK spouse and partner visas. We will first provide an overview of UK spouse and partner visas. We will then discuss each of the requirements in turn. And then finally, we'll discuss the UK spouse and partner visa process. But before we start, you should be wondering, why should I trust the information in this video? One, we are an OISC regulated UK immigration law firm. Two, unlike other firms, we specialise in UK spouse and partner visas, and as a result, we've helped thousands of partners get their UK spouse and partner visas. And three, we're unique in that many of our immigration advisors have worked in the Home Office, who are the UK government department which will process your visa application. And so feel free to click the like button if you want to see more of these kinds of videos from us. What is a UK spouse visa? Let's first quickly clarify what we mean when we use the term UK spouse visa. A UK spouse visa allows the person applying, the applicant, to join or remain with their partner in the UK, the sponsor, if the sponsor is a British citizen, has indefinite leave to remain or settled status, has pre-settled status or settled status under the EU settlement scheme, or is in the UK with refugee leave or humanitarian protection. It's also relevant for partners of those who are in the UK with limited leave as a worker or business person under Appendix ECAA extension of stay, but we won't elaborate on this here as it's only applicable to a tiny percentage of applications. The visa will be valid for three years if the person is applying from outside the UK and two and a half years if the person is applying from inside the UK. And we will discuss whether you'll be making an application from outside or inside the UK too, so don't worry if you're not sure sure about that yet. One benefit of a UK spouse visa is that it leads to indefinite leave to remain, otherwise known as ILR or referred to as permanent residency, as well as British citizenship. And if the applicant gets a UK spouse visa, unlike those in the UK on a fiancé visa, there will be no restrictions on being able to work in the UK. Will we be applying from outside or inside the UK? Whether you will be applying from outside or inside the UK is something that's very important to know. And this is because the application process, the requirements and fees that you have to pay are different. First of all, if the person applying, the applicant, does not have any valid long-term UK visas, they will have to make an application from outside the UK. Second, if you want to submit the application from inside the UK, which most partners will prefer, the applicant has to be in the UK on a visa which has been granted for longer than six months. An exception here are those in the UK on a fiancé or proposed civil partnership visa who can submit an application from inside the UK. And finally, those in the UK as a visitor cannot apply for a partner visa from inside the UK. For example, this is Bob who's in the UK as a visitor. As a Canadian, in other words a non-visa national, Bob can enter the UK without applying for a UK visitor visa beforehand. If Bob wants to submit a UK spouse visa application, however, since he does not have any non-visitor visas which were issued for longer than six months, he will have to return to Canada or his other country of residence and submit the out-of-country application there. This video will cover both out-of-country and in-country applications. The UK spouse visa fees. If you submit the application from outside the UK, the current fee that you will have to pay the Home Office to process your UK spouse or partner visa application will be £1,538. If you submit the application from inside the UK, the current Home Office fee will be £1,048. In addition to this, the other main fee is the Immigration Health Surcharge. The Immigration Health Surcharge, often referred to as the IHS, is a mandatory fee that provides applicants with access to the National Health Service. This costs an additional £1,872 if the application is being made from outside the UK and £1,560 if the application is being made from inside the UK. Out-of-country fiancé visa applicants do not need to pay the IHS for the fiancé visa application, but they will be required to pay it when they shortly extend the six-month fiancé visa. There are some other more minor 
minor fees associated with the application, but we'll discuss them in a separate video which will also discuss numerous frequently asked questions in relation to the fees. Step 1. Learn the visa requirements. The first thing to note is that you must learn the spouse and partner visa requirements before you submit the application. This is because it's normally the case that the requirements must be met on the date that you submit the application by paying the home office fees on the online application. This is known as the date of application. Let's first start with the UK spouse visa relationship requirements. The first requirement is that the applicant must fall within the definition of a partner in the immigration rules. To apply as a spouse, the applicant, the person applying for the visa, must be married or must be in a civil partnership with their sponsor. There are two alternatives to this. Firstly, the applicant must have lived with the sponsor in a relationship similar to a marriage or civil partnership for at least two years before submitting the application, in which case they will be applying as an unmarried partner. When applying as an unmarried partner, the only difference to a spouse visa application is that you must evidence that you've lived together for two years as partners instead of submitting a marriage or civil partnership certificate. This, however, can be less straightforward to evidence and is something that we discuss in part one of our Common Partner Mistakes video series, which can be found at migrate.org.uk forward slash video, link in the description below. The second alternative is for applicants who intend to get married or enter into a civil partnership in the UK, in which case a UK fiancé or proposed civil partnership visa will be appropriate. Again, whilst the requirements are almost identical to those applying as a spouse, since the application process and costs are slightly different, we may make a separate video specifically discussing the fiancé and proposed civil partnership visa applications. Okay, so back to applying as a married or civil partner. If you and your partner will be married or are in a civil partnership when you submit the application, it's important to know that the marriage or civil partnership must be valid under the law in force of the relevant country that the marriage or civil partnership took place. Therefore, it's absolutely fine if you and your partner married outside the UK, again, as long as the marriage is legally recognised in the country in which the marriage took place. The second relationship requirement is that the sponsor of the application, otherwise known as the UK partner, must be 1. A British citizen 2. Present and settled in the UK For settled sponsors who are overseas when the application is submitted, they will be deemed present if they express in the application that they will be returning to the UK with the applicant and regarding the meaning of settled, this essentially covers those who have indefinite leave to remain or permanent residency. 3. In the UK with refugee leave or with humanitarian protection. Or 4. A person that's been granted pre-settled or settled status under the EU settlement scheme. Or 5. In the UK with leave as a worker or business person under Appendix ECAA extension of stay. Requirement number three, you and your partner must be aged 18 or over when the online application is submitted. Requirement four, you and your partner must have met in person. And for those in arranged marriages, it would not necessarily be problematic if you first met on the date of your marriage ceremony. Requirement five, you must intend to live together permanently in the UK. So this requirement does not normally require you to provide specific documents to show that you intend to live together permanently in the UK. Rather, in most cases, it will be implied based on you submitting the application. It's worth noting, however, that if you're applying to extend a partner visa, which has already been granted, and you and your partner, during the validity of the partner visa, spent a significant amount of time outside the UK, this may be something that's worth addressing, as the Home Office caseworker may question your attention to live in the UK because of this. Requirement number six. You and your partner must not be within the prohibited degrees of relationships. In short, this essentially means that you can't be immediate family members. With this being said, the applicant and sponsor may be cousins as the immigration rules does not prohibit this. Here is a list of the prohibited degrees of relationships. Feel free to pause this video now and read this if there's something which concerns you. The next requirement is that any previous relationships of the applicant and or sponsor must have broken down permanently unless it's a relationship which falls within one of the very few and rarely relied on exceptions. This requirement focuses on previous legally recognised relationships, in other words, previous marriages or previous civil partnerships. Therefore, as long as in your application you don't say something along the lines of my wife will be living with my girlfriend and I. You don't have to concern yourselves with any other kinds of relationships. If there have been previous marriages or civil partnerships, this must be evidenced appropriately. 
For previous marriages, you must provide a decree absolute or overseas equivalent, not a decree nisi or decree nisi equivalent, as this document is not considered final. Other acceptable documents, depending on a particular circumstances, include a final order of civil partnership dissolution document or overseas equivalent, a death certificate or an annulment. The eighth requirement that we will discuss is that your relationship must be a genuine and subsisting relationship. Now, the first time I heard of this requirement about eight years ago, I thought it was absolutely bonkers. How does one prove that their relationship is genuine? One approach taken by partners is to submit everything that they can possibly get their hands on, such as photographs, chat logs, statements from friends and family, photographs of restaurant menus, a picture of a rock which was found on a beach stroll together, anything. And I think the reason for this is because most partners feel that they have to guess what the home office caseworker will give weight to, and that many partners are willing to provide anything in light of the fact that the visa means the absolute world to them. But what we know from my colleagues who worked in the Home Office is that many of the relationship documents that partners submit are just completely disregarded. Home Office caseworkers will consider, among other things, whether you've cohabited and if so for how long, whether you have children, how long you've been in a relationship, whether you have shared financial responsibilities, and whether you've visited each other's home country and family. So there are two things I'd like to note here. Firstly, you'll be glad to hear that the relationship requirement is not something that tends to cause partner issues. Rather, it's more the financial requirement, which we will discuss later on in this video. Secondly, for a minority of applications, there are a number of factors that are particularly important to note, such as the applicant's and sponsor's immigration history. But to prevent this video from being 17 hours long, we can make a separate video about this. If, of course, we see that people want to see it. So feel free to like the video if you find it helpful. Let's now discuss the numerous ways to satisfy the spouse visa English language requirement. 1. Majority English speaking nationalities. If the applicant is a national of one of these countries, this is not something that you will have to concern yourself about, so this requirement will already be met. And the reason for this is that the applicant will be deemed to be a national of a home office designated majority English speaking country. 2. If the applicant is aged 65 or over when you submit the application, the English language requirement will automatically be met. And three, if the applicant has an academic undergraduate degree, master's or PhD from a UK university, fortunately, all you will need to do is submit the degree certificate. So those are the three easiest ways to satisfy the English language requirement. If none of the previously discussed ways to satisfy the English language requirement are applicable, then most commonly applicants tend to sit a secure English language test, otherwise known as a CELT. In short, if the applicant passes one of these tests from a Home Office approved test centre at the required level, the English language requirement will be met. A1 is the minimum level requirement for the first partner visa, yes, even if the first application is being made from inside the UK, and A2 is the minimum level for the first partner visa extension after 30 months in the UK. We have numerous articles about the secure English language tests and the English language requirement on our website migrate.org.uk, and if I don't get absolutely demolished in the YouTube comments, we may release videos specifically discussing this. 5. You can accompany an English-taught academic degree or above, which was awarded outside the UK, with documentation from ECTIS, which was previously known as UK NARIC. Based on the thousands of partners that we've helped, however, it's worth noting that this can be a bit of a fuss, and partners often find it more convenient to just sit an English language test. If you do want to go ahead with the ECTIS process, the documents that you will require will vary depending on what country the qualification was awarded in. If the qualification was awarded in one of these countries, you will only need to get confirmation from ECTIS that the qualification meets or exceeds the recognised standards of a bachelor's, master's or PhD in the UK. You'll note that this is almost identical to the majority English speaking nationals list. The exception here being that Canada is not listed here. If the qualification was not awarded in one of these countries, you will have to get confirmation from ECTIS that 1. The qualification meets or exceeds the recognised standards of a bachelor's, master's or PhD in the UK and 2. The degree was taught or researched in English at or above the required level which again is A1 for the first partner visa and A2 for the partner visa extension. And finally, it's worth noting that there are two English language requirement exemptions. These are 1. The disability exemption, where disability prevents the applicant from learning English or taking the test, and 2. The exceptional circumstances exemption. So exceptional here actually means exceptional 
meaning that the inconvenience of having to travel to another country to take the test will not normally suffice. We elaborate more on these two exemptions on our website, so if you are one of the few in which this may apply, you may decide to give that a browse. Let's now discuss the tuberculosis requirement, often referred to as the TB requirement. Ok, so there are a few things to note here. The tuberculosis requirement is only relevant to spouse, civil partner, unmarried partner, fiancé and proposed civil partnership visa applications made from outside the UK, in limited circumstances, which we'll shortly discuss. If the application is being made from inside the UK, a TB test will not be required. Sponsors will also never be required to take the TB test, even if they've been living with the applicant in a country which ordinarily requires TB tests. The TB requirement also applies to dependent children who are applying, and a TB test, where required, specifically involves attending a home office approved clinic not all clinics will suffice. After attending the clinic, the applicant will be provided with a TB certificate which normally follows this format. As you can see on this certificate, there should be a reference to UK visas and immigration on the certificate, and the important thing is that the certificate should say that there's no evidence of active pulmonary TB. Ok, as previously mentioned, TB tests are only required for out-of-country applications in limited circumstances. For out-of-country applications, the starting position is that the applicant will need to take a TB test if they are resident in one of these countries from the gov.uk TB test visa list. This list can also be easily found by googling tbtestgov.uk. A TB test will not be required, however, even if the applicant is resident in one of these listed countries if 1. The applicant is a diplomat accredited to the UK or 2. The applicant has lived for at least 6 months in a country where TB screening is not required by the UK and they've been away from that country for no more than 6 months. So this latter point may not be immediately clear to partners, so let's provide an example. Bob, a Canadian national, previously lived in Canada, which is not on the TB countries list, for his whole life. Bob moved to Pakistan, which is a country which is on the TB countries list, on a work visa one month before submitting the application. Bob is not required to take a TB test, and this is because even though he will be resident in Pakistan, which is on the TB list, he will have lived for at least 6 months in a country where TB screen is not required by the UK, i.e. Canada, and has been away from Canada for no more than 6 months since on the date that he submits the application, he will only have been in Pakistan for 1 month. Let's now discuss the adequate accommodation requirement. The adequate accommodation requirement will require you to show that there will be adequate accommodation in the UK without recourse to public funds for the applicant and the family unit. The first thing to note is that the accommodation that you rely on to satisfy this requirement must be accommodation which the family own or which they occupy exclusively. So this does not necessarily mean that you have to own the property that you're relying on to satisfy the adequate accommodation requirement. Rather, it's fine if you rent accommodation or are staying at a family or friend's accommodation. In fact, relying on a family or friend's accommodation just for the purpose of satisfying the adequate accommodation requirement is often incredibly convenient for partners and is in fact commonly relied on. Owned exclusively by their family, does not require accommodation to be only occupied by the applicant, sponsor and children if applicable. Rather, it's fine that the accommodation is shared with others, as long as there is at least one part of the accommodation that is for the exclusive use for the family as sleeping accommodation. The number of rooms available as sleeping accommodation is relevant here, because the accommodation cannot be overcrowded as defined by the Housing Act of 1985, the Housing in Scotland Act of 1987, or the Housing Northern Ireland Order of 1988. So the percentage of partners who read these is approximately 0%. In short, you need to be aware of this table here. On the left, you can see the number of rooms in the accommodation available as sleeping accommodation. And on the right, you can see the number of people permitted to sleep in the accommodation without it being overcrowded. So for example, if there are three rooms available as sleeping accommodation, and there are five or fewer than five people that will be staying at the accommodation, as a general rule it will not be overcrowded. Note the use of the words number of rooms available as sleeping accommodation. 
and not the number of bedrooms. And this is because the Home Office is concerned with how the accommodation could be organised, not how they're currently organised. Therefore, whilst a living room can be used as a bedroom, bathrooms and kitchens typically cannot and therefore will not count as a room available for sleeping accommodation. Another thing to note when it comes to this table is that not everyone is treated equally. The age of the persons, children under 1 year old are not counted, and children aged between 1 and 10 are counted as half, gender and whether they're a couple can also be relevant. The accommodation cannot contravene public health regulations. This is not something that's normally an issue, and realistically, it'll only be an issue if there's evidence available to the Home Office caseworker that it's likely for the accommodation to not be adequate. And the last thing to note regarding the adequate accommodation requirement is that the accommodation cannot be prospective. In other words, you can't simply say, we'll sort out the accommodation once the visa's been granted. Rather, you'll be expected to sort this out before submitting the application. This is one of the 20 25 or so commonly made mistakes that partners make, as we discuss in our free video series, which you can access today by going to migrate.org.uk forward slash video, or by clicking the link somewhere below this video. The UK Spouse Visa Financial Requirement The Spouse Visa Financial Requirements, as you may have read about already, is by far the most common cause for refusals for spouse visa applications. Since the financial requirement will certainly warrant its own separate video, we will now provide a high-level overview which will let you know 1. the level of income you need to satisfy the financial requirement and 2. how you can calculate your income in accordance with the immigration rules. So how much income will you need to satisfy the financial requirement? The first question is to ask yourselves whether the sponsor receives one of these. If the sponsor does receive one of these, then the good news is that the required amount of income is much lower. And this is because the adequate maintenance test applies instead of the standard minimum income threshold. Because the adequate maintenance test only applies to a minority of applications, this part of the video, as it discusses the financial requirement, will assume that the sponsor does not receive any of these. And again, if the reception to these videos are positive, we will certainly be happy to make a video focusing on the adequate maintenance requirement. Okay, so if the sponsor does not receive one of these, the starting point is that you will need to show that your gross annual income, that is the income before tax, is greater or equal to £18,600 on the date that you submit the online application. This £18,600 figure will change depending on 1. whether dependent children are also applying and 2. whether cash savings are being included in the financial requirement. Let's discuss each of these in turn. If there are dependent children that are also applying, this will increase the minimum income threshold of £18,600. An important word here is applying. Therefore, if you have children who are British citizens or have settled status or are not applying, then this will not affect the £18,600 figure. So this is a table which shows how dependent children applying will affect the minimum income threshold. As an example, if you are applying with three dependent children, you will need a gross annual income of £27,200. As a side note, the dependent child requirements are not always straightforward, in particular where the child who is applying is not the child of both the applicant and the sponsor. We discuss the dependent child requirements in our free video series, which can be found at migrate.org.uk forward slash video. In addition to whether there are dependent children applying, another relevant factor when determining how much income you will need to show is whether you are including cash savings or not towards the financial requirement. This is because cash savings can 1. satisfy the minimum income threshold alone 2. reduce the minimum income threshold if you want to combine it with another source of income or 3. be completely ignored if another permitted source of income satisfies the financial requirement. And this is because where one source of income satisfies the financial requirement alone, it is not necessary to evidence other sources of income. We will discuss the calculations of cash savings later on in this video. To very briefly touch on it now, however, 
This is a summary table of how much cash savings is required to satisfy the financial requirement alone. You'll note that £62,500 is required where there are no dependent children applying. So hopefully now you have a better idea as to how much income you will need to show. We will now discuss the various sources of income which can be included towards the financial requirement, as well as discuss how to calculate that income. Employment income. When it comes to relying on employment income, the first thing that you must identify is whether the employer is a specified limited company or not. And this is because if the company is a specified limited company, the application becomes much less straightforward. The requirements will change, the calculation of your income will change, and you'll be required to provide additional documents relating to the company. Okay, what is a specified limited company? Firstly, a specified limited company should not be confused with a limited company they're completely different. Only a minority of companies will be a specified limited company. A specified limited company is where, one, the limited company is registered in the UK and, and I'm going to stress each of these ands because they all have to apply in order for the company to be a specified limited company. Two, the person is an employee and or director and three, the applicant, sponsor or family members of the applicant or sponsor hold shares in the limited company, and four, any remaining shares, not including the applicant, sponsor, or family members of the applicant or sponsor, must be held either directly or indirectly by fewer than five other persons. So, for example, if the company is not UK-based, it is technically not a specified limited company. If the applicant, sponsor or family members of the applicant or sponsor do not hold shares in the company, it is not a specified limited company. If the shares are held but there are not fewer than five other persons who hold the other shares, it will not be a specified limited company. So for example, Tesco's and Goldman Sachs are both examples of companies which are not going to be specified limited companies. If you're an employee of Tesco's or Goldman Sachs, even if you do hold shares, there are not going to be fewer than five other persons that hold the remaining shares. If at this stage you're still not sure if the employer is a specified limited company or not, we provide a step-by-step -step guide on finding out whether an employer is a specified limited company on our specified limited company guide on our website, migrate.org.uk. I'll also provide a link below in the YouTube description box. Let's first discuss non-specified limited company employment in the UK. In other words, companies which are not specified limited companies. At this point, you may be wondering, can the person applying for the visa, the applicant, include their employment income? To this, the immigration rules state that employment income and self-employment income of the applicant can be taken into account if they're in the UK, they're aged 18 years or over, and are working legally. So, for out-of-country applications, that is, applications made from outside the UK, applicants' employment income cannot technically be included. Even if the applicant is a doctor earning the equivalent of £150,000 a year. For in-country applications, if the applicant is in the UK on a visa which permits employment, they can include their employment income towards the financial requirement. So, for non-specified limited company employment income, the first thing that you have to know is that employees can either include this under category A or category B, depending on their circumstances. Since category A and category B calculate income differently, as well as requires different documentation, you will need to know which category you will be relying on. If the employee will have been employed for six months or longer by the current employer when the online application is submitted, they can include this income under category A or category B, but will normally include it under category A. If they've not been employed by the current employer for six months when the application is submitted, they can only include that income under category B. Let's first discuss category A before moving on to category B. So when calculating non-specified limited company employment income under category A, you will first have to identify whether the employment is salaried or non-salaried. This is important because salaried and non-salaried employment are calculated differently. 
Salaried persons are normally paid a fixed basic amount per year, for example, £29,000 a year. Non-salaried persons, on the other hand, are normally paid by the hour or day. For example, the agreement will be something like £12 an hour or £250 a day. Like salaried positions, non-salaried positions may provide bonuses, commission, overtime and other employment perks. This salaried, non-salaried distinction is not one which is always clear, but pay slips are particularly helpful here in identifying whether the employment is salaried or non-salaried. Here's a typical example of a salaried monthly pay slip. The basic monthly salary payment of £3,213.46 can be seen here, as well as the bonus of £1,466. Unless there has been a pay rise or cut, the basic salary payment here will tend to stay the same month after month, whilst bonuses or overtime, if awarded, tend to vary. Here is an example of a non-salaried pay slip. Here, you can see the words hourly pay, and importantly, if you look at the other pay slips in the six-month period, the total hourly pay figure received will vary from month to month. Salaried employment under category A. One quick note before we discuss relying on salaried employment under category A is that the following information will relate to employment income where the employee is based inside the UK when the online application is submitted. The requirements and calculations slightly vary for sponsors who are based overseas when the online application is submitted. Most notably, they will also need to provide a job offer in the UK which satisfies the financial requirement. For salaried employment under category A, there are two different ways that you can follow to calculate the gross annual income from salaried employment under category A. The first way is the quicker, simpler way and relates to the point that you do not need to calculate the exact amount. Rather, you should ensure that the minimum income threshold is met in accordance with the calculations used in the guidance, which we will discuss, and importantly that the document-specific immigration rules are met. It is the document-specific immigration rules which home office caseworkers tend to refuse applications on. They will not refuse applications solely because you calculated the gross annual income differently from how the guidance states that it should. Again, as long as the minimum income threshold is met based on how they calculate it, I should stress that this is not to say that it's fine to calculate the income in any way in which you think is most sensible. And this is because, as we will discuss, the calculations used for various sources of income are very particular and in some instances rather counterintuitive. It still remains the case that if the Home Office caseworker calculates the income to be one pound below the minimum income threshold, the most likely outcome will be a refused application. The first way is that where the employee receives monthly pay slips, multiply the lowest total gross monthly pay as seen on the pay slips covering the six months prior to submitting the application, including basic pay, overtime, payments to cover travel time, commission-based pay, bonuses, and skills and UK location-based allowances by 12. Where the employee receives weekly pay slips, multiply this figure by 52. For example, this is Bob's lowest salaried monthly pay slip that was received in the six months before submitting the application. £4,679.46 being the total of the gross basic and bonus payment multiplied by 12 is £56,153.52, which is the gross annual employment income that can be included from this employment. You will note that we relied on the total figure which does not take into account PAYE and national insurance deductions, and this is because we're only concerned with the gross figures here. Let's now discuss the second way to calculate UK salaried employment income under category A. Only a tiny minority of partners who do not meet the previous quicker calculation need to concern themselves with this calculation. This involves the following. Step 1. Multiply the lowest basic gross pay as seen in the pay slips covering the six months prior to submitting the application by 12 if monthly pay slips are received, or by 52 if weekly pay slips are received. In this figure will be the gross annual basic salary that can be used towards the financial requirement. Step 2. Total the overtime, payments to cover travel time, commission-based pay, bonuses and skills and UK location-based allowances, if relevant, as shown on the pay slips which cover the six months before submitting the application. Step 3. Divide this by 6 and then multiply this by 12. 
step 4, add this figure, with the figure reached in step 1. The result will be the total amount of employment income includable towards the financial requirement. For non-salaried employment income in the UK under category A, follow the following steps. Step 1. Total the gross income received as shown in the pay slips which cover the six months before submitting the application. Like salaried income, you can include the standard basic pay, overtime, payments to cover travel time, commission-based pay, bonuses, and skills and UK location-based allowances. So in this example here, which uses monthly pay slips, the total gross employment income received in the relevant six month period is 17,000 pounds. Step two, divide this figure by six, regardless of whether the pay slips are issued monthly, weekly, or daily. Continuing from this example here, 17,000 pounds divided by six is 2,833 pounds and 33 pence. Step three being the last step, Multiply this figure by 12. 2,833 pounds and 33 pence multiplied by 12 is 33,999 pounds and 96 pence. This figure is therefore the gross annual income from non-salaried employment that can be included towards the financial requirement under category A. Non-specified employment income in the UK, category B. Category B is for employees who will have been employed for fewer than six months when the online application is submitted, or will have been employed for six months or longer, but do not satisfy the financial requirement under Category A. There are two things worth noting before we discuss the calculation of Category B. Firstly, if the employee satisfies the financial requirement under Category A, feel free to ignore Category B completely. Secondly, like Category A, the Category B requirements and calculations are different if you're relying on employment income of a sponsor who's based overseas when the online application is submitted. The following information applies to employees who are based inside the UK when the online application is submitted. Two tests must be satisfied to rely on Category B alone. If only one of these tests are satisfied, then the financial requirement will not be met by employment income alone. Test 1. The current gross annual income, in other words, employment which will still be held when the online application is submitted, must be higher than the financial requirement that applies. Again, £18,600 for most applications, but higher if dependent children are applying. If the employment income is salaried, multiply the most recent payslip that's being submitted before the submission of the application, which is dated within 28 days before the submission of the application, by 12 if it's a monthly payslip, and by 52 if it's a weekly pay slip. If the employment is non-salaried, there are three steps that you must follow. Step one, total the gross employment income received since employment started up to a maximum period of 12 months. Step two, divide this number by the number of months if monthly pay slips are issued, weeks if weekly pay slips are issued, or by days if daily pay slips are issued since employment started, again up to a maximum period of 12 months. Step three, Multiply this figure by 12 if monthly pay slips are issued, 52 if weekly pay slips are issued, or by 365 if daily pay slips are issued. This will be the figure from non salaried employment that can be included towards the financial requirement in test 1. The second test will require the person to have received the level of employment income required in the 12 months prior to the submission of the application. As we discuss in depth in our financial requirements article on our website, whilst you can combine cash savings with test 1, you cannot combine cash savings with test 2, although you can combine it with other sources of income. To calculate this second test, gather the pay slips covering up to the 12 months before the submission of the online application and then total the gross amount received. So I specifically use the words up to the 12 months because 1. The employee does not need to have been employed for each of the 12 months. And two, you do not need to rely on all periods of employment in the 12 months prior to submitting the application. For example, if the employee starts a new high paying job two months after leaving their other job and receives their first monthly pay slip of £30,000, they will be able to apply only relying on their first month of employment with their new employer because both test one and test two will be satisfied. Under category B, you can include basic pay or salary, overtime, payments to cover travel time, 
commission-based pay, bonuses, and skills and UK location-based allowances. It's also worth noting that whilst Test 1 is only concerned about current employment, Test 2 can also include income from previous employment income from non-specified limited companies in the 12 months before the submission of the application. Specified limited company income. We discussed what a specified limited company is earlier on in this video. Again, if you're still unsure whether a company is a specified limited company or not, you may want to read our specified limited company article on our website, which among other things provides a step-by-step -step account you can follow to identify whether the company is a specified limited company or not. Specified limited company income is normally included in approximately 99% of applications under category F. It can also be included under category G, which we'll also discuss. But if you satisfy the financial requirement under category F, feel free to ignore category G completely as it involves more paperwork. And category F already involves a lot of paperwork. So if category G can be avoided, it's best to avoid it. The first step to calculating specified limited company income comprising of salary and dividends only, is to first identify the specified limited company's most recent full financial year that passed by looking at the CT600 company tax return document. This is an example of a CT600 company tax return document. Assuming you're not watching this on a phone with a tiny screen, you can hopefully see that the financial year starts on the 1st of April and ends on the 31st of March. And from what we've seen, based on the hundreds of specified limited company applications we've dealt with, is that it's only the first year that the company's standard financial period can change. Therefore, using this financial period as an example, if an application is being submitted on the 30th of March 2023, i.e. just before the financial year ends on the 31st of March, the relevant financial year will be from the 1st of April 2021, to 31st of March 2022. On the other hand, if the application is being submitted on the 1st of April 2023, i.e. one day after the financial year ends, the relevant financial year will be from the 1st of April 2022 to 31st of March 2023. So, depending on when the financial year ends and when you submit the application, the company's accounts and tax return may need to be filed much earlier than what HMRC requires. In the second step, and as we discuss on our website, migrate.org.uk, you should then total the gross employment income that was received in that financial year, and if received, total the dividends that were received and declared during or in respect of the most recent full financial year. This will be the amount that you can include under category F if everything is evidenced correctly. Specified limited company income can also be included under category G, the difference being that you will have to take the mean average of the two most recent full financial year figures as they relate to employment and dividend income. In our Common Partner Visa Mistakes video series, which can be found at migrate.org.uk forward slash video, quite a lot of these relate to specified limited company income. And so if you are relying on specified limited company income, you may want to give that a watch. Non-employment income. The following sources of income are all categorised as non-employment income in the Home Office guidance, which are all included under category C. Both the applicant and the sponsor can include these in the financial requirement even for out-of-country applications. The general rule for these, an exception being maintenance grants and stipends, is that the amount that you can include will be the gross amount received in the 12 months before the submission of the application. Cash savings. Cash savings of the sponsor and applicant can be included for both out-of-country and in-country applications. The cash savings can be held in the applicant's personal account, the sponsor's personal account, or the applicant and sponsor's joint account. So cash savings is not something that's inherently an income. However, the Home Office caseworker will follow a formula which will calculate an equivalent gross annual income figure. We will discuss this formula shortly. Before we do, to give you a quick idea of how much cash savings you may need to satisfy the financial requirement, let's look at this table. So you will note the description in the top top left row which reads, lowest amount of cash savings held at one point in time in the six months prior to submitting the application. And the reason for this is that this is the relevant figure that is to be used in the formula, which we will now discuss. The first step of this formula, if you want to include cash savings, is to identify the lowest amount held, or will be held, at one point in time 
in the six months before submitting the application. If you're relying on one bank account, this is normally straightforward. Just find the lowest figure in the six months. If you're relying on cash savings held over numerous accounts, however, if it's not immediately clear what the relevant figure is, it would be helpful to create an Excel spreadsheet which covers the whole six month period just like this example. So by formatting the figures into this format, you can clearly show the Home Office caseworker what the lowest total amount of cash savings held at one point in time in the six months before applying is. One quick tip if you are going to do this is that many bank account websites allow statements to be downloaded in Excel format, which will greatly speed up things. And for cash savings not held in British pounds, you should use the conversion calculator found on www.oanda.com. The relevant conversion date being the date that you submit the online application. Step two, minus this figure by £16,000. And then finally, step three, divide this number by 2.5. The result will be the cash savings gross annual income figure, which can be included in the financial requirement. There are numerous cash savings requirements and caveats which will apply, as we will discuss in another video, such as where cash savings relied on the proceeds of a sale of a property or investments. If you'd like a comprehensive written account of the cash savings requirements, including written examples, feel free to browse our cash savings article on our website, www.migrate.org.uk. Pension income. The applicant's or sponsor's pension income can be included under category E for both out-of-country and in-country applications. The amount of pension income that you can include towards the financial requirement is the gross amount that is being received when you submit the online application, not the total amount received in the 12 months before submitting the application. This is the case as long as the pension income has become a source of income at least 28 days before applying. Self-employment income as a sole trader, partner or franchise. The first thing to note is that partners are only considered to be self-employed in the immigration rules if they're self-employed as a sole trader, partner or franchise. Income from limited companies which the person owns is not considered to be self-employment income in the immigration rules. Rather, such income is ordinarily treated as income of a director and or employee of a specified limited company as long as the other specified limited company conditions are met. And this is the case even though the online application form refers to specified limited company persons as being self-employed. If you're making an out-of-country spouse visa application, it is only the sponsor's self-employment income that can be included. Applicants can include their self-employment income in in-country applications if they're in the UK on a visa which permits self-employment. Step 1. To calculate the amount of self-employment income that can be included, you must first identify the most recent full financial year that passed. For those self-employed in the UK, this will be the most recent 6th to 5th of April self-assessment tax return period that passed. For example, if you apply on the 1st of April 2023, just before the financial year ends, the relevant financial year for a self-employed person in the UK will be the 6th of April 2021 to 5th of April 2022. On the other hand, if you apply on the 7th of April 2023, just after the financial year ends, the relevant financial year for a self-employed person in the UK will be 6th of April 2022 to 5th of April 2023. There are two things worth noting here. Firstly, if the self-employed person is self-employed overseas, in other words, they are not a UK tax resident, this period will most likely vary according to the particular country the person is tax resident in. Secondly, the documents that you submit must cover this period. Whilst HMRC will not require you to submit the accounts as early as the immigration rules does, this unfortunately is a mandatory requirement. Step 2. Identify the gross taxable profits from their share of the business in this period, not including any deductible allowances, expenses or liabilities which may be applied to the gross taxable profits to establish the final tax liability. And the best person to ask about this would be the self-employed person's accountant. But if they do not have an accountant, they will likely need one to satisfy the immigration rules, depending on their particular circumstances. This will be the amount that is includable under category F, as long as its evidence correctly. Self-employment income can also be included under category G. The difference in calculation here is that 
Under category G, you must calculate the mean average of the two most recent full financial year figures. There are so many things I'd like to discuss about this, such as the fact that the Home Office's definition which states not including any deductible allowances, expenses or liabilities is a rather bonkers one, as typically to calculate profits you must also calculate expenses, but this will be best discussed in a separate video. If by the time you are watching this we have not released the YouTube video discussing this, you may want to head to our commonly made partner mistakes video series which can be found at www.migrate.org.uk forward slash video which discusses this calculation of self-employment income, and we also discuss this in numerous articles on our website. So we've briefly discussed the sources of income that can be included towards the financial requirement. Let's now discuss the sources of income that cannot be included towards the financial requirement. The sources of income that cannot be included in the financial requirement. 1. The starting point is that benefits cannot be included in the financial requirement. The exception to this is if the sponsor receives, whether or not that it's on behalf of their child or not, one of the following permitted benefits. As previously mentioned, if the UK partner receives receives one of these, you will have to familiarise yourself with the adequate maintenance test, which is essentially a lower but different financial requirement. We have a detailed step-by-step -step guide for this on our website. 2. Loans and credit facilities cannot be included in the financial requirement. For example, you cannot technically loan £100,000 from the bank and then rely on that as cash savings to satisfy the financial requirement. 3. In the vast majority of cases, third parties, in other words persons other than the applicant or sponsor, cannot sponsor an application to satisfy the financial requirement outside of the permitted sources of income already discussed. For example, a wealthy parent cannot say, here are my bank statements showing £1 million, I'm happy to sponsor the applicant's spouse visa application. There are some exceptions to this general rule, however. 1. A family or friend can gift but not loan cash savings. The applicant and sponsor will, however, have to wait six months until the cash savings have been held in their account until they can apply relying on those gifted cash savings. And two, if there are exceptional circumstances, third party sponsorship is permitted. However, it's most commonly the case that the circumstances are not exceptional enough for the Home Office. So that was an overview of what can and what cannot be included in the financial requirement, as well as an overview of how income is generally calculated in the financial requirement. I use the word generally because there are quite a lot of caveats when it comes to the financial requirement. For example, when you combine income, the amount that you can include may change, if the immigration rules allow you to combine those two sources of income in the first place. Also, before you can include a source of income, all of the requirements relating to that source of income must be satisfied. If you like reading, we have written a comprehensive guide specifically on the financial requirements on our website, migrate.org.uk. The suitability requirements. The suitability requirements essentially provides the Home Office caseworker with the discretion to refuse an application for a variety of reasons. With this being said, this is not something that you should necessarily worry about, as it's uncommon for the suitability requirements to cause refusals. In short, the suitability requirements will mean that the applicant will be refused if 1. If the applicant is currently subject to a deportation order 2. The applicant's conduct character, associations or other reasons, whether or not that includes a conviction for which they've been sentenced to imprisonment for at least four years, is such that the Home Office caseworker thinks that their presence in the UK is not conducive to the public good. And on this point, if the applicant is a traffic or petty criminal offence, this is not something that will normally cause an issue with the application. And three, if the applicant, without a reasonable excuse, has failed to comply with a requirement to attend an interview, or has failed to provide information, provide physical data, or undergo a medical examination, or provide a medical report, the application will be refused. The applicant will normally be refused if the applicant has either intentionally or unintentionally provided false information, representations or documents, or has failed to disclose material facts in relation to the application. And finally, if the applicant has failed to pay NHS charges amounting to at least £500, or if they have failed to pay litigation costs awarded to the Home Office 
the application may be refused. So here is a full list of the suitability requirements for out-of-country applications. If you suspect that there may be some suitability requirements which may be problematic in your application, it will be best to speak with a regulated immigration advisor about this. And if the text is too small, even on a full screen, I do apologize. We're new to this whole video thing and we will only improve. We provide this suitability list in our free spouse visa guide article on our website, migrate.org.uk. And here is the full list of the suitability requirements for in-country applications. As you can see, this list is rather lengthy. Feel free to pause this video and then read them at your own pace. Again, if the text is not too small. Let's now discuss the UK spouse visa process. The first step is to learn the spouse visa requirements, which is why we focused on the requirements earlier on in this video. Not only is this arguably the most important thing that you should focus on, but due to the sheer volume of the immigration rules that apply to UK spouse and partner visas, learning the requirements normally takes partners longer than they initially expect. The second thing to note here is that obtaining certain documentation may take some time. For example, for some out-of-country applicants, arranging a TB test can be time-consuming as it may require that person to travel to another country to take the test. And thirdly, satisfying the immigration rules may take longer than you would expect. For instance, the relevant financial period or periods may require you to wait several months until you satisfy the immigration rules. So other than our YouTube videos, which will focus on if the feedback of this video is positive, what other sources of income should you use to prepare for your UK spouse or partner visa application? In particular, you should take the time to read Appendix FMSE and Appendix FM 1.7 as they discuss what is most commonly the cause of refusals, the financial requirement. And our website migrate.org.uk has a lot of guides all focused on UK spouse and partner visas, which thousands of partners have found helpful. Step 2. Start completing the online application form. Once you've spent the time familiarising yourself with the relevant immigration rules, the second step would be to start completing the online application form. You can easily find the UK spouse visa online application form by googling something along the lines of Apply Partner Visa Gov UK. Click on the gov.uk link which says Family Visas Apply Extend or Switch hyphen gov.uk and on the contents table at the top here make sure that you are on the Apply as a Partner or Spouse page. Scroll down to the subheading How to Apply. If you're making an out-of-country application, click the link Apply Online from Outside the UK here. And if you're making an in-country application, click the link Apply Online in the UK here. So you may have already heard about VFS, TLS or UKVCAS. I'll refer to this as UKVCAS. VFS and TLS deal with out-of-country applications, whilst UK VCAS deal with in-country applications. You will not complete the application form on the VFS, TLS or UK VCAS websites. Rather, you'll be redirected to one of these websites after you have submitted the online application. These websites allow you to book the visa appointment and purchase any added value services. For more information about the online application form, we've written an article on our website, migrate.org.uk, which discusses more than 50 things that you should be aware of before submitting the application. And it also covers commonly asked questions in relation to the online application form. So we will leave that discussion there. Step three, submit the application. Once you've answered all of the questions in the online application form, ensured that you satisfy the relevant immigration rules, and gathered the required documentation, which largely depends on how you satisfy the requirements, you can submit the application. Once you reach the payment page in the online application, you will be provided with the option of submitting a standard application. This standard application, as mentioned earlier, requires paying the Home Office £1,538 if you're submitting an out-of-country application and £1,048 if you're submitting an in-country application. When the priority or super priority service is available, it will normally be listed as an option alongside paying for a standard application. If you're making an out-of-country application and the priority service is not listed on this payments page, you may then be able to purchase it on the VFS or TLS website. If you're making an in-country application, however, you may be interested to know that it is 
only at this stage that the super priority service can be purchased. It cannot be purchased on the UK VCAS website. Therefore, if you're making an in-country application and want the super priority service, if the visa expiry date permits, you may decide to check at a later date before you make payment for the home office fee, as super priority visa appointments are released daily. The date at which you submit the application is the date that you pay the home office fees on the online application form payment page. This is known as the date of application in the immigration rules. It's important to note that this is the date that the immigration rules must normally be satisfied, not the date that the applicant attends the visa centre. Step 4. Book the visa centre appointment. Once you've submitted the online application by paying the home office fee, and once you've also paid the immigration health surcharge, you will then be able to book the visa centre appointment, otherwise known as the biometrics appointment. The visa centre appointment is arranged on either the VFS, TLS or UK VCAS website, which you will be redirected to after you've paid the home office fee and immigration health surcharge. For out-of-country partner visa applications, you'll be redirected to either the VFS or TLS website, depending on which which country the application is being made from, whilst for in-country applications you'll be redirected to the UK VCAS website. UK VCAS, VFS and TLS mainly deal with the visa centre appointment, the booking of the visa centre appointment and the submission of the documents. Step 5. Submit the supporting documents. The document submitting procedures vary depending on whether the application is being made from either outside or inside the UK. In both instances, however, we now generally recommend self-uploading supporting documents as opposed to the other various methods. The self-uploading takes place on either the TLS, VFS or UK VCAS website. You do not upload the documents on the same website as the online application form website we discussed earlier, and therefore this self-uploading can only be done after you've submitted the online application. Whilst the uploading portals used to be incredibly frustrating, it has now been much improved. This is not to guarantee that it will be an absolute breeze and that you will not face any issues, however. We upload documents on behalf of our clients every day of the week, and so we are well aware of the technical difficulties the portal intermittently faces. But we find that partners who submit the applications themselves tend to prefer this to the alternatives. And there is also the added benefit of not having to pay any additional fees which you may incur if you went with another document submitting procedure. The other ways you can choose to submit the documents will vary depending on the particular visa centre the applicant book the visa centre appointment, but this can involve 1. Submitting copies of the supporting documents at the overseas visa centre for out-of-country applications or at a UK centre, and 2. A method only available in limited locations and circumstances by posting copies of the supporting documents to an address provided. For each of the document submitting procedures, instructions will be provided to you as you progress through the application process. So it's also worth noting here that, other than the applicant's passport, original documents are not required for any of the document submitting procedures. Rather, copies of such documents, whether in digital format or in paper format, suffice. This was a hugely welcome change which was made several years ago, so you do not have to worry about important documents such as your original marriage certificate being lost in the post. Step 6. Attend the visa centre appointment. Most applicants will have to attend a visa centre appointment at a local centre in which they choose. This will always be the case for spouse visa applications made from outside the UK, but for a minority of applications made from inside the UK, applicants will not need to attend the visa centre. And this is because the Home Office are currently in the process of trialling an app that can be used by those who have already submitted their biometrics in a previous UK visa application. This essentially involves taking a selfie rather than having to attend the biometric appointment at a UK visa centre. As of today, partners can't actively request to use this app but rather are invited somewhat randomly. So applicants initially tend to be anxious about the visa centre appointment. Understandably, getting the visa is incredibly important to you both, but visa centre appointments for the most part are incredibly uneventful. Contrary to what some partners may assume, neither applicants nor sponsors are interviewed at the visa centre. In fact, only a tiny percentage of partners are interviewed as part of the spouse visa process, as in some instances the Home Office may arrange for phone interviews. These phone interviews only tend to happen when the Home Office caseworker would like some additional clarification or would like to discuss the applicant's and sponsor's relationship. 
The staff at the visa centres are there for administrative reasons only and should not influence the outcome of your application. They are not trained in the immigration rules and they will not offer any specific immigration advice. Rather, they are there to perform the administrative task of taking the applicant's biometrics. In other words, recording the applicant's fingerprints and photo, checking that the uploaded documents are legible, not that they comply with the immigration rules. And if you opt for the document scanning service, which is an optional additional cost service, they will help the applicant scan the copies of the supporting documents at the visa center. Step seven, wait for the decision. Once the visa center appointment has been attended, it's very much a rather grueling waiting game. Due to the Home Office's Ukraine response, the standard processing time for out of country partner visa applications is up to 24 weeks an increase from the previous service standard of up to 12 weeks. The Home Office say that they're actively working to reduce this. So hopefully by the time that you're watching this video, the processing time will not take as long and the priority service would have been reinstated. The standard processing time for in-country applications, on the other hand, has remained at six to eight weeks. And as we discuss in our spouse visa processing time article on our website, migrate.org.uk, which we keep up to date, the processing time normally starts when either one, when the applicant attends the biometrics appointment, or two, for the minority of applicants for in-country applications who are selected to verify their identity using the UK Immigration ID Check app, when their identity is verified and all the supporting evidence has been uploaded and submitted. When a decision is made, applicants will normally receive an email. This sometimes is received in the junk or spam folder, especially with Outlook, Live and Hotmail accounts, so don't be afraid to check there every so often. There are so many things that we can discuss about the spouse visa process, but this video has already gone on for quite a while. So for the two people who have managed to reach this point of the video, if you found this video helpful and would like to see more of its kind, you're more than welcome to like the video and subscribe. We also have more than 40 free articles and guides about UK spouse and partner visas on our website www.migrate.org.uk so feel free to check that out and let us know in the comments below what you want us to cover in the future and we'll do our very best to accommodate as many requests as possible. So that is it for our first ever YouTube video. I hope you found it helpful.